Well, it currently feels like we're on day 300 and something of a very slow-moving apocalypse. Aliens are supposedly real and are leaving ominous artifacts around the planet. And every day the government and or media announces new things to terrify us. Yet despite all this, it's time for a very grim and grim Christmas 2020. Welcome back and welcome to the show! Now remember folks, this year has been terrifying, and so why not stay in theme and buy your family something horrifying this Christmas? Screams from the Crypt and Screams from Beyond the Crypt, available now! But let's move on from the advertisements and begin the show! Grim, what are you doing? Well Grim, I'm finding this mask a little bit claustrophobic and a little hard to breathe in. Who would have thought that mask would be so uncomfortable? Shouldn't any moment of your life up until this point have indicated that might be the case? I, I really don't know what you could mean by that. When you told me you were going to be wearing a big red suit earlier, I was definitely imagining something different. What's going on with that? The suit? Well, you see, today we're looking at the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Christmas Special. Did you not do that a few years ago? No, no, no. This is the second one. Well, fair enough. Roll the tape. Brilliant. Well, in that case, it's morphing time and cue title card. Dreaming of a White Ranger is the second Christmas special from the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the first of which being the one we reviewed two years ago, I believe, about Alpha, the robot, throwing a Christmas party in the command center in which he has stolen a bunch of children. This special, however, has considerably less kidnapping of children, though, bizarrely, is also not at all about anyone dreaming of a White Ranger. I mean, I get that they were going for a pun, but puns have to be at least somewhat topical, and I don't think this one works, so already we're off to a pretty bad start. But Grim, you ask, if not about anyone dreaming about a White Ranger, what is I'm Dreaming of a White Ranger about? Well, you see, the story follows a skeleton that wants to steal Christmas, dethrone Santa, and replace the Christmas toys with evil ones of his own creation. And I know that sounds a lot like the plot of The Nightmare Before Christmas, which did come out two years prior. And I really don't have anything to say to contradict that. It certainly does. But on the other hand, I also purposely describe the plots of I'm Dreaming of a White Ranger and The Nightmare Before Christmas as vaguely as possible in order to highlight their similarities, so guilty as charged. And so what is, in more detail, the plot of I'm Dreaming of a White Ranger? Well, Lord Zed wants to brainwash the children of the world by using magical dreidels, which he plans to distribute from Santa's workshop after capturing Santa. He also plans to use Santa's elves as a slave labor force in the manufacturing of said dreidels. All five of them. It's not really a very big workshop in this episode. I think they were working with a pretty tight budget on this one. I mean, really, Santa's workshop looks like it's about as large as a small garage and has about the same production quality as a school play. But it gets the point across, and honestly, it's much better than the previous Christmas special in which the entire thing was shot in the command center. I mean, at least this time, we actually have a set. And simultaneously to this, the B story is the Rangers are setting up a Christmas party, or holiday party in general, at Ernie's Juice Bar. And I've kind of got to admire Lord Zed and Rita's vision here, because if this were any other episode of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the entire plan of the bad guys would be to ruin this party somehow, perhaps by turning a Christmas tree into a bad guy or possessing a fruitcake. 
But no, in this one they've gone all out and have decided to take over Christmas. So props to them for having larger plans. But as you might expect, the Rangers learn that Santa's been captured and Christmas is going to be ruined and that magical dreidels are being manufactured. So they get teleported to the command center and then teleported to the North Pole. And they fight the bad guys, sort of. And they save Christmas, then go home and enjoy the party. And also the little girl who was worried her father wasn't coming home for Christmas does have a father coming home for Christmas. I hadn't mentioned that earlier because I really didn't care. And so that, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. I mean, white ranger. Now, before I get into the negatives, of which there's quite a few, I'm going to go ahead and lead with the positives. This episode is far better than the previous Christmas episode that we looked at earlier. Things actually happen in this one, rather than it being just a bunch of children singing Christmas songs badly and decorating and I, I, I and whatnot. There's actually a plot in this one where things happen and the rangers have to do stuff and the rangers are in it more than 30 seconds so definitely a marked improvement there this one feels like a power rangers episode which is a pretty low bar to set for a power rangers episode but the last one didn't achieve that so you've got to give this one props for doing that and also a positive this one's very Christmassy. There's Christmas decorations everywhere. There's a Christmas party. There's Christmas music. It's all bright and colorful. And the plot is literally centered around Christmas. It's not that this episode simply happened at Christmas time, but rather Christmas is the theme and focus. And so I really do appreciate that. And now into the negatives. And I think the most glaring negative here is that while this one is a marked improvement on the previous Christmas special in which there were no rangers and no fighting and no morphing except for their brief appearance in the last 30 seconds, this one, while having rangers, they never really fight and they never at all morph. That's right, in this entire episode of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, at no point do the Power Rangers morph and become mighty. They are unsuited the entire time. They do present a somewhat convoluted reason as to why they can't morph within the episode, but let's be honest, we all know the real reason is that the American studio had no Christmas themed Super Sentai footage, and the Americans couldn't be bothered suiting up and filming it themselves. Which is really rather spectacularly lazy. I mean, hell, I've suited up and all I'm doing is reviewing it. Well, yes I am wearing the wrong gloves, but in my defense, I couldn't find mine. But a small advantage to this is that while there's no giant monster battles against the Megazord or any exciting pyrotechnics and sword fights going on while they're in their morph state, we do have a sort of battle scene which in any other episode would have been vastly disappointing but in this one kind of works because when the unmorphed rangers do come up against the evil forces of Lord Zed in Santa's workshop, they defeat them not with cartoonish over the top violence but instead with Home Alone-esque tactics. And considering that Home Alone is one of the best Christmas movies, well, I thought this was rather suiting. And really, there's just something that tickles me about an evil skeletal monster wearing a Santa Claus hat getting beaten by snowballs and marbles as he tries to kidnap Santa Claus. In any event, that's going to please me greatly. And while I would have preferred the Rangers to actually morph, I do understand that clearly this episode was made with almost zero budget, and so that was probably an obstacle that got in the way of doing some things they might have wanted to have been done. And when it comes down to it, I do prefer this episode with no morphing than no episode at all, as this is definitely one of the better Power Rangers Christmas specials. I mean, at least it's not just a clip show, looking at you samurai. I am, however, super glad that it does feature at least teleportation and the command center and the moon base, because without morphing, this episode came dangerously close to not having any science fiction elements in it whatsoever, which would have made it really not a suitable option for a sci-fi minecart episode. Although I suppose it would have had somewhat of a poetic echo, a sci-fi minecart episode with no sci-fi in it, reviewing a Power Rangers episode with no Power Rangers in it. But I digress, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, I'm dreaming of a White Ranger. It's a pretty darn good Christmas episode that would have only really been improved by having the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers actually at any point morph and become mighty. Even so, without that, I still give it two thumbs up, maybe three if we're directly comparing it to the previous Power Rangers Christmas special. 
And so that is the second Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Christmas Special. Back to you in the studio, Grin. Thanks, Grim. That was about as enjoyable as your segments usually are. No more, no less. But now something the viewers might enjoy, my segment, Grin Reviews, in which we're having a look at Pinky the Pander for the Atari 2600. This Christmas, the Atari 2600 game we're looking at is Pinky the Pander, a 2D platforming game in which you must rescue your kidnapped partner, which is a kind of cool premise for a video game, and I think more 2D platformers could stand to use it. It should also be noted that the manual mentions that the partner, Spanky, is not the only one to be kidnapped, as, as well as Spanky the Pander, so too has been animal napped Zippy the Porcupine, who is from his own titular game himself, which is kind of sort of neat when you think about it, we've got a whole shared universe going on here. The gameplay of the game is rather fantastic, it has you using your pleasure stick to move Pinky the Panda around and using the red button to jump. You need to pilot Pinky through over 120 rooms in order to find missing keys, items and presumably your kidnapped friend Spanky. Why do I say presumably, you may ask, my comment having piqued your interests? Well, we'll get to that in a bit. But before we do, let's first talk about the scope and scale of this game, because there is a lot to do in it, and it must be done in a certain order, because progressing past many of the points can't be done until you've achieved certain things before it. For instance, to get through a door, you need a certain key, but to get to that key, you need a certain item, and to get to that item, you need another key. So there's definitely a bit of problem solving going on here. And if you want to get anywhere, you're going to have to do it right. And so considering that the poacher's lair we're exploring is so very vast, it's a good thing the game came with a map. Well, that is to say it came with part of a map. The map itself claims to be half a map, but the manual that came with the game claims there are over 120 screens in it. And I counted them, on the allegedly half a map we've gotten, there are only 54 screens depicted. So really, if the manual's telling the truth, then the map is lying, and it's, well, in actuality, less than half a map. Even so, the not quite half a map we're given is a pretty good starting point. It tells you where the first few items you need are, and it also gives you a few little hints to secret areas you really need to get through to progress further. And I think if you had this game but didn't have the map that came with it, you'd pretty much be out of luck. There is, for instance, a certain piece of wall you have to walk through, and no other part of the game really suggests that this is something you need to try. So without the map suggesting that it's something that can be done, I don't think I would have ever tried it. Now, just to be clear, I'm not actually saying that's necessarily a bad thing. I actually think it's kind of cool that the game comes with a physical thing that you need to use to navigate through it. I think it's unique and pretty interesting. But I'm just saying, as warning, if you are renting this game or buying it, then make sure it does come with the map, because if it doesn't, well, you're going to run into trouble. That said, even when you do have the map, it's not exactly easy streak. The entire game is fairly complicated, and being only less than half a map, it definitely doesn't give you all the information you need. So I found myself putting sticky notes on my map to remind me where I had to go and in what order. But even then, once you go off the map, then there's not even really a place for you to put sticky notes on, so it gets pretty difficult. I ended up taking down notes in a notepad, but I do probably suggest that if you're playing this game from the start, maybe get yourself some grid paper and draw a more complete map yourself, because it'll definitely come in handy. Speaking of challenges in the game, I would say overall the difficulty of Panky the Panda sits somewhere between very reasonable and totally brutal. I was playing on the normal setting, there is no easy, and even then you're only given three lives. Although, to be honest, that's not quite as bad as it sounds, as when you do run out of lives, the game's not really over, you don't lose any of your items or anything. 
All you really do is get sent back to the beginning and lose all of your trail markers. What's a trail marker, you may ask? Well, essentially, when you get to certain screens in the game, there will be a marker that you can walk over, and when you die, rather than starting at the start of the game, you'll go back to that marker. But if you die enough times that you run out of your lives, those markers are reset and you're sent back to the beginning. What this essentially means is if you run out of lives at the start of the game and you're only three screens in, it's really no big sweat. But if you're 110 screens in when you die, well, then it does become pretty annoying. How annoying it is really starts to hammer in home when you've been playing the game for a few hours and you are, once more presumably, towards the end of it. Every three times you die, you have to go all the way at the start, which means there's a lot of backtracking to get back to the area you were, and because it is late in the game, it's the more difficult screens, and there's a lot of pretty cheap deaths and difficult platforming there. So pretty much you find yourself getting to a screen where you have to jump over three fireballs or dodge over two enemies or something like that. It's difficult to attempt, you die, you go back to the marker, you get there again, you die again, you go back to the marker, you get there a third time, you die, and then it's a minute or so long slog through areas you've gone through over and over and over again just to get back to the screen you're trying to get through to even be able to attempt it again. It essentially becomes super punishing because the game forces you to do the boring bits you've done a million times before before you can even attempt to attempt the interesting new bits you've gotten up to. Now, I do however hasten to point out that, though I might sound rather annoyed, it is a admittedly minor gripe I have here. You do, after all, not really even notice it until you're pretty far into the game, and I suppose you could just try to be better than I am at it. I would have liked an easy setting though, one where, when you die, it just sends you back to the marker and lives don't really matter at all, but maybe that's just me being overly soft and the game is too hard for me. As it stands, I didn't actually beat the game, hence why I said presumably earlier when I was talking about the end of it, as after trying to get past a couple of screens for a very long time, when I finally beat them I got to the next screen, in which I was immediately killed by two ducks, which was my last of three lives, which means to even attempt those ducks again, I was going to have to slog through all of the areas that I had been through before, many times over, plus the area I had only just managed to beat again before I could even try the ducks. And as until this point of the game I'd only ever faced off against one duck, two ducks was just too much and so I decided to call it a day. And so I guess, sorry Spanky, you're just going to have to rescue yourself. But as it stands, despite this mild annoyance in the late game difficulty of the game, it is, aside from that, an extremely fun one with very tight controls and great graphics. Which means, I guess, when it comes down to it, do I recommend Pinky the Pander? Yes, absolutely. While it got really frustrating towards the end there, until then, it was one of the best and most engaging games I've ever played. And so if you're looking for a fun panda-related platform puzzle to play this Christmas, I highly recommend you head down to your local video store and door-to-door -door pick up a copy of Pinky the Panda for the Atari 2600. Now, the more eagle-eyed viewer out there who has a strong familiarity with Christmas might well be wondering why I chose to review this game. You might even suspect that pandas have nothing to do with Christmas, and so maybe current states of the globe forced us to not get a new Christmas game this year and settle for reviewing a game we already had. Well, you would be wrong. After all, if pandas are not anything to do with Christmas, then why is there a panda float in the Adelaide Christmas pageant? Check and mate! Speaking of Christmas pageants, what are you doing this year, Grim? Well, Grim, you've definitely hit the nail on the head today when oh, you mentioned- hey, Hang on, I'm going to cut you off there. I've realized I really don't care. And so, let's cut to you. You can do whatever you're going to do, and I'm going to go try to pass this game again. Oh, okay. Well, that's a little rude. But now that he's gone, it's time for a parade. It's a beautiful day here in the Jagosium, which perhaps should be expected on account of weather in this game is static and the level is indoors. But regardless, it being beautiful means it's the perfect time for a parade. But Grim, what kind of parade, you stupidly ask, your ignorance betraying your inability to detect context clues? 
Well, obviously, it's going to be a Christmas one. And so it's time for the Channel Grim and Grin, Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts Christmas Pageant, brought to you by Mumbo's Motors and the Industrial Military Complex. And by its time, I mean it's already underway. And the first float is rather fittingly me, or at least a facsimile of. It's the Grim Float, and because it's the Grim Float, it's badass, it breathes fire, and it shoots lasers out of its eyes. Now, admittedly, those are two abilities that I don't actually in reality possess, but on the other hand, if I were a float, I would be able to do it. Proof in point, the float you're currently seeing being me if I were a float, doing it right now. And so brilliant, let's move to the next one. It's the Grin Float! And as you can see, I put about as much time into this float as Grin puts into content on this channel. It's a little bit less detailed, admittedly, but it's no less accurate. Much like my float was totally badass, this float is, um, smiling. And much like my float shoots lasers out of its eyes because I'm cool and awesome, this float cries. I think as the artistic director behind this pageant, I can proudly say that both likenesses of myself and Grin have really been done to the T. I mean, quite honestly, there was a moment just then, for a split second, where I actually forgot I was looking at a float and thought I was looking at the host himself. It really looks just like Grin, and I'm really quite proud of how it turned out. But now, enough gloating, it's time to move on to the next float. It's a pirate ship, because what would a Christmas pageant be without a pirate ship? Pirates have always been popular, they've always been near enough to the centre of pop culture, and as long as we don't make it look too much like copyrighted material, it's going to always go well in a pageant. At one point it was Peter Pan, at another point it was Pirates of the Caribbean, and in modernity, it's illegally downloading files off the internet. But either way, kids will always love pirates. And we've really gone all out on this one. Much like the Black Pearl, though not exactly the same as the Black Pearl, significantly and legally different enough from the Black Pearl but close enough to invoke it, this one has a smoke machine on it and moves on black clouds. There's also a fish down there, because fish live in the ocean, and so too do pirate ships. And unlike Pirates of the Caribbean 4 on Stranger Tides, this ship fires its cannons. I mean, seriously, did anyone actually see that movie? Spoiler alert, I did, and not a single cannon fires throughout the entire runtime. I mean, seriously, what's with that? Who in their right mind would make a pirate movie without having a single instance of cannon fire? It's a disgrace and should be illegal. And on to the next one. What's that? It's a little bit hard to see. Oh, it appears to be an accurate yet rather small depiction of a virus. Um, let's move along before we get demonetized. Next float, we have the Mario float. Mario, of course, being a video game mascot, famously starring alongside Banjo-Kazooie in Super Smash Bros. Unfortunately, he's never quite reached the same level of popularity as our beloved Bear and Bird, but maybe if he keeps trying, one day he'll get there. And then, moving straight along, we've got a tank float, brought to you by one of our two sponsors, the Industrial Military Complex. Indoctrinate your child today and bring them into the endless circle of violence by getting them a toy tank for Christmas. They'll love it. And then on to the next one, it's Logo, the famous toilet. Oh, that's not how toilets are supposed to behave. Oh dear. Logo, of course, appeared first in Banjo-Kazooie 1, the first Banjo-Kazooie game, and is appearing today in this pageant as a reminder to all about how important toilets are for Christmas. It is they who bear the weight and suffer the aftermath of our endless overeating of Christmas period, and so this floats here to appreciate them. And so a big thank you from Channel Grim and Grin, Mumbo Motors, and the Industrial Military Complex to toilets all around the world this Christmas, and what they do for us. And speaking of our sponsors, next up we have the Mumbo Motors Float. It should be recognised that all build requests done on Channel Grim and Grin since the beginning of the channel were built on location in Mumbo Motors. If your car needs tuning, or you need to be magically and accidentally transformed into a washer dryer machine, then try Mumbo Motors. And then next up, we have a viewer submitted float created by the Discord user The Rocket, which is an aluminium Christmas tree. To those of you viewing overseas, that's aluminum. Greenhouse gases, global warming, and deforestation have nothing on this tree, which will no doubt outlast us all. It should also be noted that it is undoubtedly the most Christmassy float we've had so far in this pageant, which means surely it's thematically building to the next float, and there it is, it's Santa Claus himself. That's right, girls and boys, it's the magical immortal being Santa Claus himself, who is here to grant our wishes and punish the wicked. 
And with that, and a hearty ho ho ho, Christmas has finally arrived. If this pageant has inspired you somewhat, and you're looking for something to do between courses of Christmas dinner, then get onto Banjo Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, build a float of your own, and then get onto the Channel Grim and Grin Discord and share it. It obviously won't make it into this video, but I would love to see what you bring. Thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the new year for some more creations. Until then, I have been and still am Grim Grindle. Back to you in the studio, Grin. Thank you, Grim. I'm sure that segment was as long and as entertaining as you were contractually obligated to make it. And with that, we've come to an end of a very Grim and Grin Christmas 2020, and have also practically come to an end of 2020 itself. It's been a long year, it's been a strange year, and it's been a pretty crummy year for pretty much every human on the planet. We've also really got no real reason to believe 2021 is going to magically be any better. And uh, so with that ominous remark, I've got to give the advice of find joy wherever you can, and bring joy to others whenever humanly possible. In the spirit of that, a big thank you to any of you who have watched our content this year, old subscribers and new, because our main source of joy is being able to entertain people. And hopefully we've managed to do that, and in doing so, have also brought you some joy too. We don't know what 2021 is going to bring, but we plan to see you there. And so with all of that said and done, thanks for watching. And from all of us here at Channel Grim and Grin to all of you, have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.